Shabbat Shalom, Imani Yisrael. What a beautiful presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ahava. 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 What does that mean? Love. Love. Oh, Pastor, there you go again talking about love. What does the world need? Why? Love, sweet love. Love, sweet love. Yes. Everybody talks about love. <laughs> hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. God is love. God is love. God is love. God is love. We love the Lord. Amen. Shema Israel. Adonai looking. Adonai Hechad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Yeshua said, on these two commandments hang all of the Torah and the prophets. All the Torah and the prophets. How many of us love God. Amen. Amen. And how many of us love our neighbor as ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yeshua said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. My commandments. Oh, Pastor Gil, there you go again. You're always preaching about keeping the commandments of God. <sighs> mm -hmm. It's always about doing. Can't we just simply believe? Keep. Keep. Hallelujah. Bless you. Holy Spirit. A moment of silence. We anticipate that the Holy Spirit will fill this place. Beautiful, beautiful worship, presence of the Lord. Our aim is that our preaching and our teaching will never be with human wisdom, intellectualism, the heart, with the unction of the Holy Spirit, so that it's the anointing speaking. Because when the anointing of God speaks, what's going to happen? Will you experience what Israel experienced at Mount Sinai? Oh, hallelujah. Exodus. All of you turn into Exodus today. Hallelujah. And what can I say? Exodus 24, verse 1. Imagine all of Israel has gathered together at Mount Sinai. We've been following the history of a people that God called his own people, his chosen people, who were slaves in Egypt, but they were brought out carried on eagles' wings, and they were brought to the place where God said they would come and serve me on this mountain. It's been a journey. And we're following this journey. And where does it lead? To the land flowing with milk and honey. I love 
And there we go with the word again, love. I love studying history. I love studying Israel's history. Because it's the history of God and his redemptive plan for his chosen people. Which begins in Genesis and goes all the way to the end in Revelation. I love studying history and how God fulfills his promise to his people. You are my special treasure, my holy nation, my chosen. The chosen people are people that God has ordained to be his royal priesthood, a holy nation, a nation that would be above every nation, but a light to the nations to bring what? The knowledge of God. So I love studying history and I love studying Israel's history because from the beginning all the way to the end, God has a plan to redeem his people, mm -hmm. his holy nation. And he promised that he would gather his people out of all the nations of the world and he would bring them back to what? Back to the land. Great promises. I love studying history. I love studying Israel's history. Israel's in the news lately. And there's a great debate going on whether we should stand with Israel or not. We must. Well, if you don't stand with Israel, study Israel's history. See how God deals with that nation, with that people who will not stand with his holy people. Remember Amalek. Uh-oh, Pastor Gil, be careful. Because when the Prime Minister of Israel mentioned that name, it sent shockwaves throughout the world. Why does it do that? And where does Israel get its mandate, its right to possess a land? What are you reading today? If you're in Exodus this morning, you're in those holy scriptures mm -hmm. that came from that history. When Israel stood before the mountain that God had said, they will come and they will serve me in this mountain. Mm -hmm. Why would God do that? Why would he bring them out of servitude to continue a life of servitude? Except they were no longer slaves of Pharaoh. They were no longer slaves of... But they were now slaves of who? Of God. And so God being Lord and their Redeemer, because who brought them out? with an outstretched. Who did it? God did. And who carried his people on wings of eagles? Who did that? God did that. You all believe that? So let's take a look this morning of what God requires of his people. His holy people. Those that have been set apart, called out to be saints of God, <clears throat> to be a holy nation, to be a royal priesthood, a holy people. What does it mean to be a holy people of God? There's a word that comes to mind, and it is called zeal. How many have a zeal for God? Now, you either have a zeal for God intellectually or you have a zeal from the heart. 
And if it's from the heart, it is what? From love. Because what's not from love, even though you're the most intelligent purpose person on the planet, but if you don't have love, it will profit you nothing. Why do we do what we do? Because we love God. And why do we love Israel? Because we love the God of Israel. Amen. And we love the Israel of God. Yes. And for any intellectual person in their zeal of what? Patriotism? America first? Yes. That we will turn our back on that nation which God loves and calls his nation? His people? Or that we have such a zeal for Jesus Christ that we will hate the very people that he came to redeem and he died for? Hello. God made a promise to Israel that if they kept his commandments and they did what he commanded them to do on that mountain that day, that they would be head and not tail. That they would be above and not beneath. That they would be lenders and not borrowers. In other words, they would not be a hundred trillion dollars in debt like the United States of America that has to borrow from China just to carry out. Right? How many know what the national debt is today? <laughs> When is it going to crush us? Because they are sustaining those migrants. <laughs> Why? Why is America so deep in debt? Can't respect. Print more and more. And when they get together, they can't even agree how much more debt they should take on. Whoa. <laughs> so at some point, it's going to. With Crush us. I wonder if the day will ever come China will call the debt. Now the Torah says that when you don't pay your debt, what do you do? You become slaves to the lender. So is America really free? No. America's so deep in debt, and we have to keep borrowing. And then take those borrowed monies and say, should we give some to Israel or not? Well, if we are really God's holy nation, America, then why are we so deep in debt? And why is America so ungodly? and so unrighteous as to say we love the God of Israel but we're not ready to what? Stand with the Israel of God. We are. Mm -hmm. We stand with Israel mm -hmm. because God stands with Israel. And we're going to read in the Holy Scriptures this morning, in chapter 24, beginning with verse 1, that says, Now he said to Moshe, he being who? God, come up. Come up. To who? To the Lord. To the Lord. Okay. Come up to the Lord. Who is the Lord? Himself. Hmm? Himself. Himself? He said, Hashem said to Moshe, come up to Adonai. Amen. You and Aaron. Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. 
and Moshe alone shall come near the Lord. Come near Adonai. Why only Moshe? What set Moshe apart from all the others? So that they had to worship from afar. But he gets to go where? Near. Why? Why? He was chosen. He was chosen. He was chosen. You see, when God chooses, who's going to be near? And everyone else from afar. I want you to think about that for a moment. Because you see, it's not you, it's not me, it's whom God chooses. And Moshe alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. What is going on here? You can say it, Rochelle. Well, Shay's getting a very special opportunity to have some one on one in the very presence of you and Hayvall. Hey. Yeah. Moshe, he gets to go all the way up. Everyone else, from afar. It was said of Israel, what other nation has God so close? So close that for whatever reason, Israel can call on God and God will answer. And it's not a long distance call. You see, I don't play games with my God because he don't play games with you. He sets the boundaries. He chooses. We don't choose. So Moshe had a very special relationship with God that the others didn't have. So Moshe came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, Hallelujah. All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. Oh, that they had such a heart. You see, they didn't say, we will just simply believe what God says, and that's it. We don't do anything more. Israel is committing themselves to what? Obedience. Obedience, to do what God says do. Not just simply to nod your head, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, and nothing else. So does Israel exemplify a zeal for God in these words? Yeah, yes, yes. What Israel didn't say that day was, whatever God says, we will take a look at it, and if we agree with it, and after we have debated it, then we'll decide. No, that is that we will do. Mm -hmm. All. All, all, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And do you know those words came through who? Moshe. Moshe. Did Jesus follow that? Mm -hmm. The only one that has really truly lived up to that, those words, Jesus. was Jesus. And he was doing it on Israel's behalf. You see, Moshe, Jesus didn't come to destroy the Torah. He came to fulfill it. And he also taught 
that you and I who do and teach others to do will be called great in the kingdom of heaven if you don't believe it. Go to the Christian side of the Bible and read it for yourself. So Jesus held the words that God spoke to the people through Moshe in high esteem. Why? Because Moses was God's chosen. You can say, Rochelle, vessel. vessel to communicate his word to his people. And his people entered into covenant that day, all that God says to who? You. We will do. So did Israel have a zeal for God that day? Yes. Was it an intellectual zeal or was it a zeal from the heart? And Moshe wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. What is Moshe doing? Worship. He's setting up worship. An altar. An altar. Pillars. Right? Twelve pillars. Each one representing the twelve tribes of Israel. You go to the book of Revelation and you read about what, what it's like when you have those twelve gates and the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. I, I think God isn't done with Israel. <laughs> Christians, you better wake up and realize yeah. God is and always has been the God of Israel. Amen. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. What are they going to do with those sacrifices? What are they going to do with all that meat? They're going to have a meal. They're going to eat it because they're not going to throw it away. This is the part that I like. Barbecue. <laughs> and Moshe took half the blood and put it in the basins and half the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. Oh my, look at the zeal of Israel. Amen. That is the zeal of a person who loves God. Because if you love God, you will be obedient to what God says do. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Remember, last week, the question was, which ones? And so the Lord elucidated the Ten Commandments, except one, covetousness. And when he finally gets down to one thing that you still lack, Go and sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And you want to know something? He walked away sorrowful. Why? Adonai just gave you a command. Come on, people. Does the Lord still command us today? Does he still speak to us today? Amen. How many have a zeal for God? Amen. How many have a zeal for his words? For his words? For his Torah?
And so he goes on again. And what's he doing? And Moshe took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So Israel is entering into covenant. And what does blood have to do with the covenant? Everything. Because what does the blood do? Gives life. What? Purifies. 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 us from all sin. From all sins. Today it's the blood of Yeshua. It's his blood. Now, when we are sprinkled with the blood of Jesus, what do we do? Does that just give us now the liberty to forsake the commandments of God and go do whatever we want? No. no. Is that obedience? No. You are being set apart, sanctified, holy to God, to be a servant of the Lord. That means as his servants, he is our master. And what our master commands, it is our duty to what? All that he says, do we do it? The Apostle Paul said these words. The law is good if one uses it lawfully. There's nothing bad about the law. Why? Because God gave Israel the law. And what are we going to find in those words that God gave to Israel? What are we going to find? All that the Lord has said we will do. Well, let's go back a little ways to the beginning of the parasha. And what are we reading? Rochelle, can you go to that first verse of the parasha where it begins? No, Exodus. Oh, this begins with 21. Exodus 21 and verse 1. Yeah, these are the ordinances. Okay, now these are the judgments, these are the ordinances which you shall set before them. Is this part of the words that the people are agreeing to abide by? Yes. And it says this, if you buy a Hebrew servant, what does your version say? If you buy a Hebrew servant, I thought the Hebrews were free. So why is God giving a law regarding Hebrew slaves? He wants to set them free. They are already free. They're not in Egypt anymore. So how does one become a slave? Because as the people, they're going to be those who are either out of misfortune or out of not and the only way you can be out of misfortune with God when he made a promise to you mm -hmm. is by being obedient you see indebtedness is a sign of disobedience it's what makes you go from being a lender to being a debtor mm -hmm. it's getting quiet in here the more the United States sinks into debt, the farther away from God the United States has become. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. So that we have a government that is so lawless, they can't even decide what to do. So they're in confusion. They have a zeal for patriotism, but not according to what? It's not coming from love. There is a zeal that is so arrogant and so ambitious that it will impose its ways upon a people, even if those people don't want it, to the extent that it will use force against them. But we don't want to hear that. But note this. He shall serve six years and the seventh, he shall go out free and pay nothing. You know what that means? That you can mess up economically, 
fall into hard times, but it shouldn't go with you for the rest of your life. So it was never God's intent that we would be what? Slaves. Slaves no. forever. If he comes in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters. And he shall go out by himself. It just depends on what? The circumstances. <clears throat> but if the servant plainly says, I love my master, oh, I Ahava, my master. I love my master, my wife and my children. I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an owl, and he shall serve him forever. Yes, Christians, we're free. But because we love our masters so much, we want to do all that he says do. That's why we strive to keep the commandments from love. Not because of legalism, not because, no. So you're going to tell me that if I strive to observe by Torah that I somehow am at odds with you when my love of God is to such an extent that I want to do all that he says do. And that certainly is how we treat one another regardless of their economic status. So all those people that are crossing that border who happen to be our neighbor, what are you going to do? Because if you separate them and you indenture them and you treat them with anything less than what God has ordained and then turn around and worship Jesus on Sunday, hallelujah, and then do all of these atrocities the rest of the week, what does that say about we as a nation, hypocrisy. Why would God in his Torah give permission for slaves, for servants? It's how you treat one another. Remember, you love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, with all your might, and you love your neighbor as yourself. This is the whole of the law on these two commandments. It all hangs there. Because the true test of your love of God comes down from what he commanded you to do when it comes to how we interact with one another as human beings. In the words of our Lord Jesus who said, love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples indeed if you have love for one another. He shall serve him forever. And if a man sells his daughter to be a female slave, what man in his right mind will sell his daughter? But it's in the law. If she does not please her master, who has betrothed her to himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has dealt 
deceitfully with her. What's the deceit? You're not fulfilling your word. And if he has betrothed her to his son, he shall deal with her according to the customs of daughters. If he takes another wife, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, her marriage rights. I think that's where we get the concept of alimony. Right? Yeah. What does this have to do with our relationship with God? Does God take marriage seriously? To go back on your promises, to go back on your vows? It's treachery. Imagine that. That would be like Israel saying all that God says we will do and be obedient and turn around and not do it and be disobedient. You see, the Lord's standards are high. high. <clears throat> and if he, he does not do these things, Three for her. Then she shall go out free without paying money. She shall go out free. What does that mean? She's not indebted to him. She's not indebted to him. You see, notice the relationship that God is mandating on his people. God said this of Israel. I am a husband to you. I have betrothed you. Will God ever go back on his word? So when did Israel cease to be? You see, it's amazing, isn't it? How we can be so zealous for our Christianity that we will look with contempt upon our Jewish brothers and sisters because they don't follow Jesus. I think that makes us judgmental and partial and everything God is not. See, God shows no partiality to any person. God looks to all of humanity's shortcomings and makes provision how we're to deal with those shortcomings, how we deal with each other. God doesn't look at borders and determine which people should be counted more worthy to be treated like a human being and other people who should not. The love of God should manifest itself in the love that we have for one another as people, regardless of who we are. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. What do we call that in today's society? Manslaughter. Because yeah. maybe he didn't intend to kill him. They got into an argument. And it got physical. And one person ends up dead. Does that happen every day? Yes. But we live in a lawless society that doesn't want to prosecute. Mm -hmm. The criminal. But they want to villainize who? The victim. But we are such a godly nation. Matter of fact, it's in our money. In God we trust. It's in our decrees. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for who? All. Is God <coughs> meeting out justice in his Torah? You want to learn human relations? Study the Torah. Because whether you're a master or you're a servant, whether you're a creditor or you're a debtor, you have rights under the law of God. I think those are called human rights. 
how we are to treat one another. And if we're going to be true to what we say, all that he says we will do and be obedient, then let's abide by that. Let's fulfill it. Who is in a great position to fulfill these words? And then Israel, you have the unction of the Holy Spirit in you. You have the power of God in you. You have a relationship with God that all the others don't have because you can go straight to the throne of God. Amen. Like Moshe and stand in his holy presence. What are you going to do with all of that? Unction. What are you going to do with all of that that you have? One day at a time. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If you're taking the gift of God and doing nothing with it, if you're taking the gift of God and not ministering it, there's no excuse for the one that has been sealed with the Holy Spirit and promise. What made Moshe so special? He had the Holy Spirit. He was a prophet of God. The relationship that Moshe had with God. Did he walk with God? Was he a friend of God? Do you know that there is no one here that cannot have this same relationship with God? You see, when you have such a relationship with God, you become a priest of God. Wasn't that Moshe's role? And Christians go around bragging that they are what? A royal priesthood. The church brags that they are a holy nation, that they are God's saints. Mm -hmm. Well, what are you going to do, church, with all of that God spirit in you? Especially when it comes to Israel and the very people that God calls his chosen people. You see, it's, it gets thick, doesn't it? There's a breakdown. There's a hypocrisy. Of course, in many Israel, we advocate for Jewish missionaries to go, to be among those 70 that are sent out, who were not apostles, but they were part of what? Jesus' missionary teams, they were sent out two by two. In every place that Jesus was, was going to go, they would go, and they would prepare it for who? The coming of the Messiah. What do, we, what do we advocate, men Israel, but to our Jewish brothers and sisters that what you entered into that day when your people were standing before that holy mount, because it wasn't only that generation, but all the future generations of Jewish people to the coming of the Messiah were standing there with them. So what do we encourage our Jewish brothers and sisters to do? Shuvah. Repentance toward God and faith in Jesus. Isn't that the very core of our ministry? Mm -hmm. But in our zeal for Christianity, be careful how we act with our Jewish brothers and sisters who have yet not come to faith in Yeshua. Be careful that we don't try to destroy them because they don't do it the way we do it. There's a disconnector there. You see, Moshe, right? And so, the scripture says, but if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him, that's murder in the first degree. That's in the Torah. By treachery, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. 
You know what we're seeing in this? The Ten Commandments. Expounded in. You see, what do we do with these commandments? Which ones do we keep? How many are there? Well, let's take the Ten Commandments out of our government. Let's take the commandments out of our schools. Let's take the commandments out of the churches. And what do you have? Lawlessness. And isn't that taking us closer and closer and closer to the age of Antichrist? Yeah. Yes. To the spirit of lawlessness. Because the moment you begin to break one commandment, you open the door for Satan to corrupt you. To break the whole law of God. Why are we zealous for the commandments of God? Because we love God. And why do we have such a zeal for our neighbor? Because we love our neighbor as ourself. And if our neighbor happens to be Jewish, even more so because we want to reach them with the knowledge of the truth. They have a zeal for God, but not according to what? Knowledge! So God promised that in the latter days he would raise up shepherds who have a what? Who will feed my people Israel with knowledge. Knowledge of the truth. But when did that knowledge exclude the Torah of God? Be careful that we don't divide God's covenant. That's like dividing the land. And you know what God says about those who will divide his land? Because they're dividing his people. Yeah. He who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death because he's broken the commandment. Thou shalt honor your father and your mother. But society is teaching us that fathers and mothers don't matter no more. The public schools are not teaching that to your children. They're taking your tax dollars, right? And they're making them disciples of the devil. And they're embedding in them the spirit of lawlessness. Imagine what that generation is going to be like 20 years down the road. He who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. You know how many news reports of children rising up against their parents, beheading their fathers, beheading their mother, killing them all? Where is this coming from? It's coming from a spirit of lawlessness. And where is it being breathed by our own government? It's perpetuating lawlessness. If a man beats his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he remains alive a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his property. Wow, that's in the law. But humane treatment of people, regardless of their status, is still mandated by the Torah of God how we are to be with one another. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished according to the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the, as the judges determine. I guess that is what we call a lawsuit. What are we finding in the Torah? Law. To govern society. Because when we have a society without law, we have what's called lawlessness. And that lawlessness is what the whole world is being consumed by that spirit of lawlessness because it's setting the stage for the Antichrist, the lawless one. So why is our zeal for the instructions that God gave his people Israel, if we embrace those instructions, 
for our own good as, as humanity in our relationships with one another, why are we being judged? To the contrary. Was grace given to us to be a license to sin? No. Absolutely not. And it goes on throughout the whole part of the show. So by the time we finally get to this part where Israel is saying all that God says we will hear and be obedient, right? So Exodus 24 again, and beginning with verse 9, then Moshe went up, also Aaron. They all went up, but only Moshe gets to go where? That's right. And, and, and you see, what's happening on that mountain? See? Moses went up, the 70, and they saw the God of Israel. Did they really see him? Has anybody seen God and lived? Who saw God that day? Moses. Moses. How about those 70? They saw God. How can you see God? His glory. How many have you seen God? You see God in His words. Because the Word of God becomes what? It manifests itself. Remember, He created all that we see by His Word. Imagine when His Word comes into you, what is it producing? What you're seeing in those obedient lovers of God is people get to see God in you. But when you are not being obedient to what God says do, how can you come and try to tell me to have faith and believe in your God? When I don't see any evidence of God in you. They saw God. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God and they ate and drank. They're fellowshipping. When we see God... It's a time to celebrate, to rejoice and be joyful. That's the koinonia that happens when God is in the house. Amen. Then the Lord said to Moshe, come up to me. I know a lot of you are waiting for those words, come up hither. Right? Yeah. Come up to me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. Wait a minute. Moshe is being given these commandments to do what? Teach them. I love Moshe. I do. And Moshe arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. Did Joshua get to go? And he said to the elders, wait here for us, that's plural, until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and and her are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moshe went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. 
Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moshe out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moshe went up into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. I think he was raptured up into the mountain. He didn't have to climb it physically. He was supernaturally what? Caught up in the cloud. Doesn't that sort of sound like a rapture? <laughs> now who's going to go up in this rapture? The lawless ones? No, no. But those who have such a relationship with God. Remember Moshe? But Joshua. What made Joshua so special? That he'd get to go up. Next in line. He's next in line. Now, let's go to Matthew's gospel. You remember? Moses was given what he was to teach the children of Israel. What does Jesus have to say about that? And this is what he has to say, and we will repeat it again and again and again because it's very important that we understand this, that Jesus didn't come telling his people. He says this in Matthew 5 and verse 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, has heaven and earth passed away? No. It has not passed away. It is still here. Until it passes away, what do we do with that? That Moshe received on the mountain. Until heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments. This is what happens to those who break the commandments of God, no matter who you are. And teaches men so. Whoa! I think Jesus is calling out those false teachers who will teach contrary to the commandments of God. And persuade a whole people that they don't have to obey God's laws. What did Jesus say about them? They shall be called least in the kingdom of God. So they won't go up there like Joshua. Because Joshua was an observant follower. We know his zeal. Right? What can God do with an obedient servant? What is God going to do with you when you have a zeal for his law? When you are zealous for his, his law and his prophets? He's going to bless you. He's going to bless you in it. Amen. You shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And so you see, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom. Who wants to be great in the kingdom of heaven? That should be every hand here, Emmanuel. Yes. Yes. Then do what the Lord says do. Show me where in the Bible God advocates disobedience. He promises disobedience. He tells you what's going to happen in your disobedience. Mm -hmm. And he also tells you what 
Blessings come your way when you are obedient. So what's the difference between obedience and disobedience? The difference between good and evil. Life or death. Life or death. You see? Now why would we be maligned for preaching obedience to the commandments of God? The only ears that are going to be what? Offended by that are the lawless ones that don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. So they want a religion that doesn't require anything of them. It's getting thick here. All right. Well, let's close this out in Mark's Gospel. See? And let's look at another mountain experience. Mm -hmm. Remember, who went to the mountain? Moses. Moses. Who went up with God? Moses did. And Moses went up to be instructed by God so that he can come down and teach the people. What do you do when you go up to the mountain with God and he instructs you and then you turn around and come down that mountain and what are you supposed to do with that? Teach it to the people. See, Scripture says by this time you all ought to be teachers. Teaching the people. That's what makes you great in the kingdom when you're doing what God commands you to do. It begins with you. It begins with me to set the example, to be the model of what it is to be observant to God's commands. That's what makes us effectual witnesses to him when they see God in us. And it's going to be based on our conduct. But notice this. He said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. I wonder who's that going to be. The rapture is coming. Get ready for it. And everyone that gets caught up in the rapture, they go up to meet the Lord in the air. Yeah. So you better reserve your, your plane tickets. Because <laughs> the, only, the only flights that are going to go up to meet the Lord in the air are coming out of Jerusalem. I wonder who's going to go up there. The obedient ones? Or the disobedient ones? Obedient. The obedient ones. See, Joshua had a privilege that the others didn't have. <clears throat> and notice that not even Moshe's own brother, Aaron, yeah. went up. You would think it'd be Aaron because he was the brother of Moshe. And he was also Moshe's what? Spokesman. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them his clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow, such as no launder on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with who? Moshe. Moshe. That same Moshe that went up on the mountain with God is still alive today. What does that tell you? There's life after death. That there's life after death. <clears throat> Do you think that Moses confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior so he could be saved? Yes. yes. Who was standing on that mountaintop? Who instructed Moshe? Jesus. Come on now, you can say it. Yeshua. I know Yeshua was on that mountain. Yeah. See? But you got three of all the followers of Jesus, only three went up 
with him on the mountain. Right? They were talking with Jesus. Elijah was talking with Jesus. Moshe was talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to, to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moshe, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. You see, when you are in the presence of God, when you are in the presence of his glory, you are greatly afraid. because of his holiness. And a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And what did the son say to his people, to his followers regarding the law and the prophets? Teach them, do them, set the example for everyone else what it is to love God. Isn't that what we as preachers and teachers should be doing today? This is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one but only Jesus with themselves. Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them, that they should tell no one the things that they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. Sounds to me that they're getting to experience God in a supernatural way. What merits us to do so? We love you. If you love God, you know what Jesus promises to those who love him and keep his commandments? He'll manifest himself. He'll manifest the Father. The Father and the Son will come and they will dine with you. They will come into your home and be present with you. See, we all have this opportunity to experience God the way Moses experienced him, the way Joshua experienced him, the way those seven they experienced him. How many want a greater experience with God? A closer walk with Him. Yes. Isn't that our zeal? Yes. yes. Isn't that our love? You see, when the zeal comes from love, from the heart, I'll show you what it is and what it is not. experience something great. But they had a question. And what was that question? We have questions. See, they asked him saying, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Are the Jewish people waiting for Elijah? They even set up a place for Elijah. Yes. Then he answered and he told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. So there is a time of restoration of all things that must precede what? The coming of the Lord. Do you believe that that restoration involves Israel to the land and the relationship that Israel had that day with God at that mountain? Yes. Yes. We long for that day, for those times of restoration to come. And what did Elijah do? What was he preaching to the people? Repentance. Shuvah is the same thing we preach and teach to the Jewish people. Repentance toward the God of Israel and faith in Yeshua will come through that repentance. 
Because how can we have restoration without Jesus? He is the restorer. He is the redeemer. He is the one who is the Messiah that will do all of these things and fulfill all that is written in the law and the prophets. Every promise that is in the law and every promise that's in the, in the prophets and in the Torah regarding God and his relationship with Israel must be fulfilled. Then the end will come. Amen. The zeal that comes from arrogance is not the zeal that comes from love. You see, in Mark 9 and verse 13, then he came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, I think that's the Jesse house. <laughs> Jesus did a lot of ministering out of the house. He asked them, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. Well, he had just told them, if you want to be great, do the commandments and teach others to do the same. You set the example. And so they were disputing who's greater. And he sat down, called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Now John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us. Casting out demons in your name. And we forbade, forbade him because he does not follow us. In other words, there is a zeal that doesn't come from love. In other words, if you're not one of us, then we don't really take what you're saying to heart. A man of Israel, that can never be us. We're all different. Whether we're in churches or we're, we're in synagogues, understand. That we have a responsibility to follow Jesus and do as Jesus commanded his disciples to do. And when it came to the Torah, when it came to the prophets, where in Jesus' teaching did he tell us not to do that? Obedience. But Jesus said, do not forbid him for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. What does that mean? What we do, we do in the name of Jesus. When we go to the Jewish people, we do that in the name of Jesus. When we fellowship with them in their synagogues, we do it in the name of Jesus. And when we minister to them in whatever they need, we do it in the name of Jesus. 
Because Jesus said, if you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And if you've done it unto me, you've done it unto the Father who sent me. The Father sent Jesus, and Jesus wasn't sent. He wasn't sent to Rome. He was sent to the Jews first. Because, you see, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. Why do we establish a different order? Because we simply don't obey God. If you did, you would be doing what the Lord says to do. We don't go to the Jewish people to advocate for a different gospel. What we advocate is all that Moses says do. Why? Because that's your duty. Because all of Israel entered into covenant. All that God says to you, we will hear it and obey it. Be obedient. Why should we teach otherwise? And if we want to be great in the kingdom of God, be that teacher that teaches them to observe and set the example what observance is all about because you have the Spirit of God in you. Amen? Amen. For sure. Thank you. When he started out, or somewhere in there, he mentioned how this parasha is expounding on the Ten Commandments, that it, it gives clarity and depth and, and all that's needed. And that's exactly right. According to the Hebrew word that starts this parasha, it starts with that vav that I mentioned earlier. It's a connector word. In English, we use the word and. And as soon as we say and, we know we're connecting two things. That's what this is doing. It's the connecting. And we used that same Hebrew word, that same Hebrew letter, excuse me, in, earlier when we talked about love and to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and spirit. It's the connecting, God connecting us through His word, through His love. And that's what this is all about. The more that we connect to the Lord, the more we will be obedient to his word. Because, as Pastor Gail said, when we come to him, then he puts his spirit in us so that we can do. Not just say it, but we can do it. It's all about the action. It's all about the follow-through. It's all about keeping. Ooh, hallelujah. It's the Holy Spirit that causes us to ascend into the heavenly realms. You want to go up to meet the Lord in the air? You're going only going to do that in the spirit. The carnal man, the carnal Christian doesn't have those mountaintop experiences. They, get, they have to worship from afar. Who gets to go up into the inner chamber? You can only do that in the spirit. And what do you think the spirit of the Lord is going to teach you? He is God. And He will instruct you and teach you so that when you come and now you're before the people, you bring the Word of God in the unction of the Holy Spirit. Not with worldly philosophy. Not with what is falsely called knowledge. But the truth. Because you received it from the Spirit of truth. That is God Himself. Ain't that something? You all have access to the same throne room in heaven. They shall all be taught by God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So as we close in prayer, dedicate yourself even now. <coughs> yes. I don't like to say it this way, but it's what pops in my mind. Beam me up, Lord. <laughs> Beam me up. That was very popular a while back. But may we go into that presence, up that mountain, into the Shekhinah glory cloud, and have a meal 
with our God. Lord God, open our hearts to receive. Burn into us. May it enter in every fiber of our being. Your word. Lord, you know our hearts. That we do want to be obedient. We want to hear and we want to do. And we cannot do it ourselves. But by your very spirit who you've given us. Those who have opened our heart. Lord, you've given us your spirit to dwell within us. To prod us. To correct us. To teach us. To guide us. To lead us to light and enlighten us. And we praise and we thank you for this gift. Lord, let us love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our spirit. And then, Lord, pour us out. Fill us up to pour us out. That we might glorify you by showing you to our neighbor and neighbor. <coughs> we thank you and praise you for entering in a covenant with us. And allowing us to enter into a very special, intimate, one-on-one -on -one covenant with you through the shed blood of Yeshua, sealed by your Spirit in your very presence, O oh God. Praise you. In the holy name of Yehovah, Yeshua, and the Ruch HaKodesh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Amen.